Hi, everyone. Just one second. So the slides are on the website, so feel free to download. Just one second. Sorry about that. 
Yep. So. Okay. All right. So let's get started. Do you see the slides? Okay, sounds great. Okay, so first of all, a few announcements. So the assignment four is due next Tuesday. It's June 7th, 11 p.m. And final project again is also due the same day and uh, no, no penalty late days uh, can be used. So uh, if you have leftovers, then please feel free to use them. Um, for the final projects, um, Please prepare a 10 minute presentation and you will have up to three minutes for Q and A. So it will be 13 minutes altogether. So you won't be graded. I think I talked about this before, but you will still need to be there and present. So uh, if you miss it, then you will get 10% deducted. But if you do really well, then you will get up to 10% uh, more from your actual grade of the report. But the, the actual grade is basically coming from the um, report. And if you just present something, then you will not get any point deducted. So uh, don't worry about it too much. But if you think that uh, you need to make up for something in your paper, then you probably want to do your presentation pretty well. Uh, TA will be actually leading this week's lab session, so um, I, I'm actually away. So um, there will still be quiz, but mostly it will be quiz and also the um, going over your assignment for if you have any question. And some GPT-2 uh, tutorial too, I mean, not tutorial, but more of a um, um, coding practice. So um, of course, these are now, they don't go into your assignments. You just uh, are working on your final assignment. So I think you have a little motivation on working on them, but uh, still, I think the materials that we're gonna cover this week will be interesting. It's basically GPT-2 and Fuchsia Learning. So uh, please attend. And next Tuesday class is canceled. So originally we were going to have uh, next Tuesday as the le final lecture and the next Thursday as the final lab session, but Anyways, we have only two final projects. And also, um, I also have uh, some personal issue on Tuesday. So I'm canceling next Tuesday uh, class. And we're going to have our final lecture on uh, next Thursday, which will also have the two final project presentations. Um, so it will be around 45 minute lecture and 30 minute presentation on the last day. So, uh, and yeah, please, uh, please note that. So. Any question on these announcements? Okay, yeah, we're working on them. So we'll release that pretty soon. I think probably this week. So assignment two results will be probably published uh, around, this, around this week. And we'll aim to publish the uh, assignment three results within um, two weeks. And of course, assignment four will be actually very uh, last minute, I think, because it was submitted very last minute. So let's aim for um, assignment two this week and assignment four or three uh, on June 14th. And then uh, your assignment four will be, of course, um, yeah, right before the grading deadline which will be late June. Yeah, sorry for the delay, by the way. Any other question? Okay. So let's get started with the today's class. So we're gonna today talk about mostly GPT-2 and um, well, actually this is not really exactly um, comprehensive. So we're gonna have one more, uh, which is uh, actually in context learning, but uh, we're gonna start with GPT-2 and GPT-2 is a very interesting paper in many ways. Uh, we're gonna see that. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about uh, zero shot and future learning, which I think um, has been, of course, there for a long time, but I think GPT-2 is one of the first work to really show the 
possibility of such uh, language model driven uh, zero shell or future learning. And of course, so they're also fine tuning for um, future learning, which is a bit different from uh, when you're fine tuning with the like thousands of examples. So let's first talk about GPT-2 um, in a nutshell. So GPT-2 actually was released in February, 2019. So it's been almost three, actually more than three years and um, it's very, uh, uh, yeah, time goes fast. And in fact, it's much earlier than T5. It's actually almost right after birth. So uh, timeline wise, we're kind of going back to the past, uh, but there is a reason why we're actually covering this after T5. Um, it's a decoder only transformer. We're gonna see the exact details in the next slide. Um, basically what that means is then um, there is no encoder. So it's only decoder. So it's all, everything is autoregressive here. So attention is never looking forward. It's always looking backward. Um, it's a um, vanilla language model training. So no masking, no um, noise injection. And it's up to 1.5 billion parameters. So it was actually bigger than BERT, although they were actually around the same time. Remember that BERT was around um, October, 2018. So, um, and their model was uh, 300 million parameters, but GP2 was able to actually uh, make this bigger uh, in a much, I would say, very small period of time, very short period of time, like in uh, three months. Or I mean, to be more exact, to be to also knew that their um, model can be bigger to be better uh, at the same time as BERT. So in some sense, GP2 is kind of concurrent work to BERT. So people were thinking about same similar things in the same period of time. Um, so what they're saying is that, what the paper is saying is that the state of study art on the perplexity of seven, seven out of eight language model data sets zero shot, which means basically, of course, training is language model. So when they say zero shot here, what they really mean is that um, the, these data sets are actually different domains from the, um, the training domain. And this was actually one of the first evidence that zero shot learning is feasible. And also another um, bullet point that I, I missed is that also it's one of the first evidence that fluent writing is also feasible too. So let's first look at the uh, GP2's decoder, how it differs from transformer. So first of all, GP2 used byte level BPE. So this actually means that it's not using Unicode level. Unicode is actually, um, it's not single byte, it's actually multi-bytes. Um, so that means that uh, Unicode has too large number of vocab, but then byte level BPE makes this much um, smaller. Of course, um, there were some issues like uh, they didn't want it to merge across different character categories. Like for instance, uh, dog exclamation mark, this can be one vocab word. They didn't want that. So they basically made sure that they categorize different characters into different categories like character or these uh, special characters. And then they cannot be merged when they're doing BP. Remember the BP is uh, iteration of the merging. So they will not merge the some certain kinds of uh, classes of characters. It largely follows OpenAI GPT's decoder. So what that means is that uh, GPT's decoder was also largely follow, following transformer decoder, but they drops encoder, of course, yeah, because it's decoder only. And that means actually um, they reduced the number of parameters by half and the, they were using push embedding, which was kind of similar to BERT. And the uh, layer normalization, people I think always play with this. Um, so original layer norm is moved to the uh, input of each subblock. So it's actually different from how T5 did, right? Remember that T5 moved layer norm to the um, actually, well, actually um, they took uh, to the actually to contain the entire, I think the entire block, what was a subblock. And they um, also have a additional layer norm after the final self-attention block. But you see that the layer norm is being still used um, everywhere. So it, it, it is basically a very important um, component of transformer, definitely. And they have a modified weight initialization, but that's it. So basically, the, it's not too much different from the transformer decoder. And the uh, vocab size is about 50,000. So it's actually larger than BERT, which has 30,000. Uh, context size is 1024. That's also larger than BERT because BERT had 512 and batch size during training was about 512, which is around the same as the BERT. 
So apparently now GPT-2 was at the scale of BERT or even larger, uh, although GPT-1 was not at all. So the GPT-2 zero shot um, is a really interesting uh, task that they did in the paper. So um, they didn't just do language modeling. So they found that giving an appropriate instruction as, as the context to GP2 does the target task without seeing any training example. So what that means is that, for instance, let's say uh, we have a, we want to do reading comprehension. Then what the what the paper does is that they put document and question in front and put the answer A. Uh, I mean, not answer A, but just character A. So it basically just have a prefix to the language model, right? Um, because when we're, when we're doing language model, um, you basically want to generate the next word given the uh, certain prefix. So they are defining prefix this way. And that basically gives 55 F1 score on COCA. It matches three out of four baseline systems uh, without using uh, the such big training, uh, training examples for the task. So this is really interesting because, well, um, that means then uh, it never saw these examples, but it still does pretty well. So it was really surprising, at least uh, was not actually happening in every data set, but then people were quite surprised that, well, you can just train language model. And then if you can give uh, appropriate prefix to language model, then basically it gets some task done. Of course, it wasn't perfect because it wasn't doing that good in other tasks. I was doing okay, but not like usable. So summarization, um, they put documents and then um, TLDR, and then the whatever comes after this was actually the summary of document. It wasn't that good, but still did some um, summarization. Uh, translation was actually even more interesting. What they did was that, um, but they basically, um, instead, well, I mean, one thing they could have done is that translate the following sentence, some, some similar to the T5. But then instead, what they did is they basically give an example of English sentence equal uh, in English, uh, a French sentence. And then they basically put the target sentence and then try to generate whatever comes after. So technically, this has to have one example. So it's not really zero shot. So it's more of a one-shot translation, but then it basically outperformed several unsupervised empty systems, not the supervised one, but unsupervised. So it still also kind of worked too, not the best, but uh, question answering, of course, this means uh, open domain question answering without any context. Um, they just put the question and then basically they were able to get 4.1% on squad. And they were saying that this is not that low number given that um, many actually, uh, if you do this, in many cases, just 0%. So that was like a, a what GP2 showed. And although their main message was this plus um, whatever comes actually after, which is the uh, full on generation. So what also amazed people back then was that GP2 was able to generate an incredibly full on text, such as a news article. Note that it doesn't mean that it's always consistent. Uh, well, if you take a very close look at it, you will see that there are some really weird things, but it still kind of worked well. So there's an example here. So uh, they basically gave this uh, non-highlighted part as the prefix, and then they were uh, they asked GP to generate the rest. It's actually the hugging faces um, demo. It looks and you you see that it's very natural. I mean, very um, fluent. Um, so some people, of course, said that uh, maybe this is actually coming from what. They trained on, but then apparently it's not the case because um, GPT-2 apparently wasn't there when they trained it, right? Because apparently um, they were, um, um, it, it was before GPT-2 was released. So, but still it's actually able to generalize somewhat. Um, probably it's actually using a lot of information from GPT-1, but anyways, um, you see that it's actually working um, it's actually generating fluent sentence. So uh, that was what, what amazed people. And I think it's very similar moment to what Gen did in an image domain. Um, basically the model is now good enough that people cannot often distinguish between the real and fake ones without um, paying a very careful attention to them. Yeah. 
so um, it's actually um, very interesting that uh, GPT-2 was now able to perform some fuchsia learning or zero-shot learning. And there are actually really two important questions though. Um, after taking a look at BERT and GPT-2 oh, and oh, T5, we actually see that um, BERT actually was very nice in that it showed uh, it showed that the one might need only a thousands of examples instead of hundreds of thousands by fine tuning BERT to reach a very good accuracy in classification. So then people, what people really then got interested after that is that, okay, thousands is not bad, but it's not the best either. So can we, is it all still possible to fine tune it with a much smaller number of examples, say hundreds or even tens? So that was like a one question and extra answer is uh, not really because if you just train BERT with tens of examples, then it becomes very unstable. The training becomes very unstable. But still, um, people were able to go from hundreds of thousands to thousands. So why not thousands to say tens, right? Uh, and then GPT-2 showed that using language modeling can um, perform zero shot learning, though the performance was not was too low that it wasn't really usable. So is it possible to improve the model so that we can perform such zero shot and future learning with practical performance that can be applied to real services? So those are the two important questions that arose after BERT and GPT-2 were released uh, in late and er late 2018 and early, tw early 2019, which is like three years ago. And then a lot of progress has been made since then. So, um, for, so the, the answer for the first question is that we basically want to have a dedicated fine tuning technique for fuchsia learning because when you have very small number of examples, not thousands, then how the model should be fine tuned needs to be different so that it can work. So when the number of examples is too small, uh, it basically becomes very unstable. So um, one of the really um, most popular methods, which is still also popular, is decreasing the number of parameters being tuned, which has shown to be uh, very effective. Um, but then the question, of course, is then which parameters shall we tune? Um, and basically, what kind of parameters should we introduce to tune? So um, this is a very big research area right nowadays. We're going to talk about that today a bit. Um, and number two is, um, well, GP2 introduced an interesting way of doing machine translation, if you remember. Um, so this was really interesting because they actually have an example inside this prefix sentence, it's one shot. So then it was natural to think about, can you actually extend this further? For instance, can you actually give more examples to the in uh, instruction? Then would the model do better? Um, so what they call this is it is in context learning because they are providing the training examples in the context. So it's basically why training is happening in the context. So it's in context learning. Um, it became also drastically more effective when the model size increased by more than hundredfold. So actually, that's exactly the point of GPT-3 because the uh, model size is 175 billion, which is more than hundred times bigger than GPT-2, 1.5 billion, right? So this actually was released around, um, well, one and a half year later, like about um, 15 months later in 2020. Okay, so, um, but then this is really out of scope, I think. Um, we're, we're not gonna talk too much about GPT-3 itself. Um, I mean, itself is, I think these days very, um, its use case is becoming even more diverse than before. Um, so, um, for instance, it's now being used for like uh, things like GitHub's Copilot. Uh, it's coding assistant. But um, instead, today's lecture will be more about few shot learning, and um, zero shot can be considered as like one special instance of few shot learning, uh, in my opinion. Then um, I think there was really really nice summary of research, research, recent trend in zero, zero and future learning with pre-trained LMs in NLP at ACL uh, 22, which is like basically just last week. And I thought that maybe um, instead of um, other things, uh, maybe going over this a bit with you today would be nice. Although uh, it's very long tutorial and 
I don't aim to cover everything as well. It's actually, I encourage you to take a look at the, um, I'm not sure the video is available now, but the later it will be available. And also the slides are definitely available. Um, so in this lecture, we're gonna cover mostly section two and three, but uh, definitely encourage you to take a look at it. We're gonna just see how basically these two methods work. Number one was um, basically fine tuning for future learning. And number two was in context learning. Very, very briefly though. Um, Okay, so that's what we're going to do today. Um, so let's see. Any question up to here? Yeah, it's actually um, what Digita said is very interesting too. So. Yeah, they found that the um, basically adding, yeah, let's think step by step basically does things very well in, especially in like reasoning problems because um, reasoning problems actually requires you to like think step by step, right? So I think it basically means, I think uh, we are still, it's, it's still yet to explore how these language models really work. But it's really, it was really interesting and crazy. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Okay, so let's go into this um, slides. Just let me get some water and come back and um, let's cover this together soon. Just one second. All right, so do you see the slides? Okay, so yeah, let's get started. Okay, so uh, this tutorial is from uh, Ease, Armin, Robert, no, Sewan, and Samir. This was actually uh, just like one week ago, so it's very, uh, very recent. and. They're basically, um, it was tutorial on uh, zero and shot learning in NLP. So by the way, so what the tutorial, tutorial is basically, um, it's a special session in conference that um, they usually have uh, some hot topic, right? That they uh, they want to cover and basically, but then it, it's very also very recent that there's no really textbook or any, um, you know, really dedicated 
materials yet. So uh, these tutorials usually aim to create such dedicated material and also um, collection of uh, recent work and summarize them. So it's very good actual work if you're um, relatively not too familiar with certain uh, certain um, area, but then you basically want to do um, you know very uh, cutting edge research or want to know what's going on then uh, it's a very good way of, I think, learning things because uh, these people basically are working on future learning. I have been working on them for a long time, so they're basically experts. So we're going to basically talk about um, part two and part three, but then I really recommend you to also take a look at other parts too because they're really interesting too. Um, it's, uh, it's very, especially if you're working on future learning. So let's go for the part three first, because that's what we talk about first. How can we fine tune um, something like BERT or some language models with a few examples, not um, thousands, but say tens or hundreds? I think it's, uh, here we go. So the part three starts at here. Yeah, slide number 78. So um, they say it's a gradient-based LM task adaptation because um, compared to in-context learning that what we just talked about, uh, which basically doesn't fine tune the model. So it doesn't actually change the model at all, but then it's called gradient based because they actually can compute gradients on these few examples and try to update language model. That's why they call it gradient. Oh, by the way, um, so I think today uh, we're gonna just go for the uh, next uh, 20 minutes or so, and then end the class early as well, because I think, um, it's better that way than the, uh, than having a having a break in the middle. So it will be a short class today too. All right. So um, so basically, that's why they call it gradient based, and they they talk about. Uh, two methods, which is, I think, relatively obvious. One is that they uh, fine tune all the models, all the model weights, right? So that means they're just basically using something like BERT, but then um, trying to do a bit better, which I think one thing that you want to also be aware of is the prompt-based fine tuning. Um, so what that means is that in the traditional fine tuning, you just give input and output uh, to basically uh, fine tune the model to map the input from output, but then in prompt based fine tuning, you append the prompt to the input so that uh, we're hoping the language model will be able to leverage that as well. Um, although I think there are also, I think, um, okay, so it's, it's, it, when it's few shot, then this, is, this can be very helpful. Um, and there's also parameter efficient fine tuning, which means they're only fine tuning a portion of the parameters. And among others, I think um, one thing that we want to talk about is adapter and the LoRa. Um, so these are basically um, the methods that allow you to fine tune very small number of parameters among say millions of parameters and still be able to do well. Um, it's, it's still especially useful for future learning, but not just future learning. Sometimes they're actually using the um, language model. They want to basically fine tune language model, but then they don't want to introduce too many new parameters because it will take up a lot of space. Okay. And also we're gonna, we're gonna be um, looking into things like prompt tuning, which is um, tuning the prompt side as an embedding. So first of all, full tuning approach. So it's uh, very straightforward, but uh, what they mean is that for instance, in BERT, they put the input like, like this and then basically they try to fine tune everything here where the these like green things are all being fine tuned. Um, so that's great. Uh, that's very great. Uh, but then the problem is that such such uh, full fine tuning are very unstable in future setting. And 
stability can be improved by uh, some hyperparameter tuning, such as using small learning rates, uh, training for more iterations, or um, re-including debiasing terms in atom optimizer. So basically um, changing the optimizer, but then uh, it still basically underperforms other methods. So it's not the best way. And there is a bit a uh, better way of doing this, which is prompt-based fine-tuning. And but that just means that they basically combine prompting with fine-tuning. So, um, well, what that means is actually um, they don't just end here. It, this is just fine-tuning, but instead of that, they basically append um, some prompts here. And basically it's hoping that it's trying to do some sort of language modeling because of this mask. If this was BERT, for instance, then basically you can, um, you can hope that the language model will guess this correctly. And what we're hoping that that will be, for instance, uh, either great or terrible. And the correct answer is, has a more probability than the other. So um, there were a few methods that showed um, pretty good results on this. And I think one of them is, uh, for instance, um, um, they were using a uh, variation of T5, actually exactly T5, but then they did the same, they did this, this kind of thing using T5. So this was, I think, um, late 2019 in December 2019, after T5 was released, they basically used T5 to uh, perform this kind of uh, prompt-based fine tuning. I'll skip other things for now. Um, but then, um, it's also worth noting that um, basically this only can handle single token verbalizer. When they say verbalizer, it means that it's something that we want to fill in like mask. So it's like a single word verbalizer, but then it, you might want to have a, a multiple verbalizers, right? Uh, I mean, multiple words, because uh, you might want to generate multiple words for some reason in future learning. So. Um, how can you do that with for the mass language model, which is only uh, trained to guess one word? Um, well, number one is don't use them, apparently. Um, number two is that we can do some sort of autoregressive decoding. You can basically mask the next one, and then also you can try to uh, actually guess the next one iteratively. Or, um, well, other way is that uh, you can basically try to um, Actually, yeah, I mean, that all regressive decoding is like one way. And uh, number, number three is actually some sort of a um, notion approach, which basically means that uh, we're gonna actually not talk about this in details, but you can think of this as uh, you can create a probabilistic model uh, by using its uh, uh, posterior. And actually, let me see if there is a good example, but I, I'm gonna, we're gonna skip that for now because I don't think um, it's something that's more advanced. Uh, but then, um, but the, the question, the point is that um, it basically becomes a, a bit more challenging if you want to do multi-token verbalizer, um, not just single token uh, when you're doing prompt-based fine tuning. So we're gonna skip that. So anyway, so um, giving a comparison between the um, prompt-based fine-tuning and in-context learning, what we're going to talk about in uh, quite soon is that um, model size is usually much smaller when you're doing prompt-based fine-tuning. You can use something very similar to bird size, whereas in-context learning is known to not work below, say, 10 billion parameters. So it's very hard to actually perform this if you have a small number of parameters. Usually they use like something like GPT-3 or uh, something similar to that. And good thing about in-context learning, though, is that, uh, yeah, of course, the bad thing is that the model size is really big, but then um, the task-specific parameter is effectively none because you never fine-tune anything. But the prompt-based fine-tuning, you're still fine-tuning everything. So um, that's still pr problematic, right? Because we want to actually decrease this number of parameters being fine-tuned. So that, that there comes the parameter-efficient fine-tuning. And basically what they're doing is that they're trying to basically just fine tune only 1% of the model parameters. So interesting thing is for instance, um, they want to basically model this prompt, but this the prompt doesn't have to of course um, 
at the at the last. It can come also in the in the front. And basically, instead of uh, using actual words as the prompt, um, what they they did is that basically they create an embedding which is uh, trainable, and basically they put in the into the uh, first token. So when they're training this model, they're just training this red part. So it's still most part of the model is frozen. They're just training this the first embedding, but then this embedding can be tuned so that it can act like a instruction or some prompt for a language model. That's what they're hoping that it plays such a role. And basically this is called prompt tuning because they're basically tuning the prompt in the vector space. But the name is very, um, well, it turns out that I also realized recently that like, this name is very, very confusing. I mean, I think it was not just me because everyone was being, was being confused because it's like everyone's using, uh, for instance, prompt tuning, but they're actually meaning different things. So I think it will need to come to an agreement among people soon, but then you can think of prompt tuning as something similar to that. Basically, you're tuning something uh, on the embedding side and you're you want to consider that as a prompt. So there are like several different methods. Um, um, for instance, like, um, like these ones, um, but then they have different names, right? Like it's basically aliases, right? Alias means that you have a, uh, you're talking about the same thing with different names. So some people call it prompt tuning, some people call it P tuning, some people call it OptiPrompt, Warp, uh, but at the end, it's very similar. Although there are um, some differences, like P tuning has uh, some difference. Uh, they have, um, um, or is it um, LSTM before feeding to the model? So, but then at the end, um, uh, prompt tuning works compatibly uh, compared to full model tuning. But then, um, but also we have to be careful that the results are not always the best. So sometimes other uh, methods work better than prompt tuning, but it's still very popular in the industry because it's really simple. Like you don't have to really think about much, right? You basically just have to, tune uh, whatever comes in front, right? Okay, so um, there are also um, a bit more, um, well, advanced methods like um, not just tuning this embedding, but you're also tuning the um, these parameters, where basically the outputs of the first um, token, which would have been just, I mean, actually this makes sense because when you're, you have a decoder, not BERT, but if you have a GPT, for instance, two, um, or three, then this first part anyways only depends on the first token. So if you, did, you have only one token, then this part is anyways um, dependent on the um, embedding. So why don't we just make that into also trainable parameters so that we have a very flexible, um, cap, uh, flexible, um, well, I mean, we can be very flexible about what the language model can do. So that's what the, um, uh, the prefix tuning soft prompts did. Um, so that, that's another method, but you see that's quite similar to relatively, um, they're talking about the same thing. Uh, they're trying to choose which part of the model they want to tune. And they want to make it not too big so that the model is relatively stable during training, but also it's not too small so that it can be actually adapt to your target task. And um, let's, just, uh, let's finish this section with the two two important things. One is adapter. So adapter is uh, basically referring to your, it's referring to basically a very small network that's uh, appended to existing network. And that network basically uh, is allowed to um, change the output with this uh, fit forward that works. So it's very simple, actually. It's, you can think of this as a very similar to the residual connection. But then um, basically residual connection is that you have uh, some fit for network and you add that to the um, um, the input of the fit for network. So it's very similar to that. But then the the uh, the purpose is a bit different. The purpose here is that instead of, uh, um, well, making connection, it's the other way. Um, you're starting with uh, no model, but then you basically put a um, some extra um, fit forward. So it's the other way, right? In the residual connections, you are starting with the uh, fit forward and you're adding the connection so that you can train better. In From the adapter's point of view, it's the other way. It was actually just uh, no, no module in the middle any, uh, at all, but then you just basically add a module 
in the middle with this connection so that it can adjust the um, um, input or the output uh, in the uh, in a different way than the, the frozen model would, would do with the undefined tuning. So using this is also quite, um, in many cases, effective for fuchsia loading instead of tuning entire um, parameters because it's able to actually, um, well, tune the outputs. Um, other is LoRa. Um, basically, it's a low rank addit additive updates to model weights. Um, so that, that's what this stems for. But then it's very interesting because if you are doing adapter, for instance, uh, you basically have uh, this very, um, I would say, feed forward network, which is say D by D, right? But then you basically have a low rank in the middle, it's R. Uh, and then basically because these map to R and R is mapped again, again to D, in this case, the number of parameters will be two times D times R. And if R is much smaller than D, then basically this will be saving parameters a lot, right? So that's what LoRa does. And it's basically uh, one way of adapter, you can think of it as one of an efficient adapter. By the way, so these methods exist and um, there are some comparisons, but I'm gonna skip that. That's it for section three. So I think um, it's, uh, you see how uh, basically parameter efficient training helps you to, um, I mean, there, what kind of parameter efficient training there are to actually um, do pre learning. We didn't really cover how well each method does. That's because also the evaluation is very difficult for, for pre shot learning. And if you're interested in that part too, uh, please take a look at part five. But please note that this field is very um, early in the um, field. And also it, mean, it means there are a lot of, um, um, well, there is like, uh, there is no really one, um, one way of uh, evaluating that everyone agrees. So it's basically, it's really hard to, I think, compare between different methods without being really the expert in the field. But um, anyways, but still, I hope you get the uh, point that there's uh, these, these methods for official learning these days. Um, we're going to go to then uh, part two and then try to finish um, before 10. So in context learning is um, in fact, also called uh, prompting because you're giving the prompt to the um, input. And basically it's um, language model perspective. It's trying to generate the next sentence given the previous sentence and you just want to uh, basically then um, somehow, well, design the previous sentence so that you, your language model will generate the correct next sentence that you desire. So that's the, basically the, uh, the point of um, prompting. And also um, you basically hope that this will work well. So prompting was actually um, kind of, I would say it's kind of introduced in the uh, GPT-2, right? But then, um, GP2 was not back then to focus on that, but they also showed some sort of uh, in-context learning. And this got popularized by GP3, although it was, uh, I think, first introduced in GP2. So what uh, we talk about this, right? Uh, basically, um, it doesn't just give the prompt, which is kind of instruction or um, some sort of uh, uh, what to do, but then they also give examples, right? Uh, what should be the input and what should be the output? And then, um, Basically, it's trying to see what it generates, right? And the results were quite amazing with the GPT-3 back then because as you increase the size of GP 3 from small model to large model, and then if you compare like few shot to the birds, so one shot is still pretty good too. Like, so if you actually compare one shot to, for instance, bird, then if you fine tune bird large to glue, you get 70%. And bird is still a very good model, right? But then if you have actually a very large model, and if you just give one example, you see that um, it's getting like a uh, similar score. So it's very amazing because you have never used any example here though, unlike bird, which use every uh, example in glue. Of course, um, this is still, we see still limitations, which is basically, uh, if you actually fine tune it really carefully, then you, you're getting up to 90% reaching humans, uh, human performance and GPT-3 with uh, one shot or few shot learning, it's not able to really reach that. But then still um, in many applications, when you only have a few examples, then 
uh, it, it's clear that um, this is very, it will be very useful. So there are some other um, graphs that's telling you that uh, the performance is pretty good. They're even like as good as like fine-tuned robot at large. Um, and one thing to note is that, we, as I said before, um, when the model is very small, it's almost actually useless, right? Because let's say they were, we we're operating with like 0.4 billion parameters, which is about bird size. Then we see that the in-context learning isn't working at all because it's like barely above random guessing. But we see that the, it has to be big enough and also has to have uh, at least uh, a few examples to actually, or to have, uh, or so it's not, it shouldn't be just zero shot or it should have at least, at least a few examples to be non-trivially better than the random guessing. But there are other, um, but usually we see like a pretty good performance. Like uh, in this case, for instance, they were able to actually get state of the art in trivia QA, even better than fine tuned state of the art when they had few shot learning K equals 64. So it's, this was very am amazing result by GPT-3 too. Um, okay, so, but uh, you can take a look at, a closer look at that, but then you will see that sometimes it gets much higher score than the uh, fine tuned state of the art. So it's, it's very promising. Um, although there are also other analysis that um, it, it might be, um, well, there might be, we have to actually be more careful about that. But anyway, so the point is that the in-context learning works um, in, in many cases. So uh, the rest of the tutorial basically talks about uh, these verbalizers or patterns. So basically you can think of this as like how you actually word your prompts because um, that's really important uh, for these in-context learning and it's very uh, sensitive. So I think it's very relevant to what Nikita said, right? I mean, if you just put the let's think by step by step at the prompt then sometimes it does really well for a reasoning task. So um, it's important to really uh, see that the, why these patterns verbalizers are really important. Actually, its importance has been never um, exaggerated um, as we see these days, right? Um, and uh, I think you can take a look at this, but then the, one of the issues is that in context learning it has a very high variance. So, um, as you see, like this is a super high variance uh, you, depending on the training examples and also uh, what the pattern is or what the prompt is. So the high variance makes it very hard to evaluate. So that's actually also what's covered in the section, I think part five or six. But um, so there are uh, uh, several methods trying to basically mitigate that. Um, I think that's what also the trail talks about. Um, but in a nutshell, basically we talk about this noise channel too. Um, but in a nutshell, um, basically there are several methods trying to mitigate these um, very unstable train or maybe unstable performance. And um, I think, yeah, I just wanted to talk about this method too. It's really interesting. Uh, I think I briefly talk about this in this part, part three, but basically uh, this noise channel method, what it does is that, as you see, instead of trying to directly predict the, um, the next sentence given the pre previous sentence, th this is what you want to do in most cases. What they formulate the problem into is that uh, basically they want to compute the posterior distribution, which is the, what's the probability of the prefix given the, uh, um, the, the what's, whatever comes next. And good thing about classification is that you know that this is, has only a few possibilities. Let's say if you're classifying into good or bad, then you know it's either it was great or it was terrible. So you can enumerate this very easily, which means you can actually compute this probability as well with your language model. So that's what this method did and trying to basically um, do the in-context learning in a, well, more of a uh, probabilistic way than decoding way. But anyways, the using uh, choosing the best examples. Uh, if you're using 32 shot, then how can we use how can we choose the, the best 32 examples to do the future learning is really important in this kind of work. And also ordering is important too, what they say is. Um, yeah, so I think um, there are a few takeaways. Um, first of all, one of the 
key findings, or I'll say it's still very, I think it's um, people might debate different uh, differently. So we cannot always say this is entirely correct, but then there are some evidences that demonstration or the prompting, basically what the prompt is telling us to do is kind of instruction and the examples. Demonstration is different from just the instruction because demonstration includes the examples too in the in-context. Uh, they do not teach a new task. They, uh, what the paper is saying is that it, it's about just lo locating an already learned task during pre-training. Um, of course, it's, up, uh, it's actually, um, not everyone might be agreeing with this, but um, it was one of uh, interesting, I think, um, results in, in, the, in, the, in last year. And also there was another work that basically showed that the, uh, um, well, you don't have to really give correct labels to the inputs. I mean, in the context, you can just actually give wrong labels, but still model does well. And this actually very aligns well with uh, this finding, right? Because it's more about test location, then um, we don't really need the labels to be correct because you just have to locate it. But I recommend you to uh, take a closer look at this trial too, if you're interested in this direction. Um, but um, in any case, I think um, we're gonna skip these. So there, there are several open questions. And if you're actually doing research here, there may be something that you want to read carefully these parts. Um, so it's very sensitive. It's sensitive to the training examples. And also it has a very high inference cost because you have to use very large model. Um, then it's also really hard to scale it because when you're using long context, um, then the model will be even more inefficient, right? So um, also it's really hard to evaluate its same message across the tutorial um, and it's very slow in progress and we're still trying to understand how it works. So it's very early stage, but has a very high in, uh, value because uh, future learning basically enables new products to be uh, invented in a very easy way, right? All right, so um, I think that's it for uh, today's lecture. So um, I hope that was a good overview, a uh, very brief, but also sufficient overview of future learning. Um, so we're gonna cover a bit about these things in the lab session, but also please use lab session for asking questions about the assignment four. Uh, you will still have quiz 11, that will be your last quiz and it will be going into your grade. So please be sure to attend the lab. Next Tuesday, Tuesday, again, we don't have class. And Thursday will be our last lecture. And we're going to also have final presentation on next Thursday as well. So any question? OK, if not, then let's end the class here. OK, thanks, everyone. <laughs>